Today I'm going to show you how I proved what everyone already knew, that the lyrics of pop songs are getting more and more repetitive. <laughs> but I also hope to convince you that this is actually a good thing. I wanted to measure repetitiveness in pop songs. I know a repetitive song when I hear one, but it's surprisingly difficult to translate that intuition into an algorithm. There are a lot of reasonable-sounding approaches that turn out not to work. For example, counting the number of repeated words. Because it doesn't just matter which words you use, but how you use them. Songs may repeat individual words, but they also repeat phrases and whole lines and big chunks of lines. A good measure of repetitiveness needs to account for repetition at multiple scales. The solution to this came from an unlikely place, namely compression algorithms. To measure a song's repetitiveness, I essentially squeezed it into a zip file and measured how much it shrank. The more it compresses, the more repetitive it is. <laughs> the intuition here is that repetitive lyrics are more redundant, and a good compression algorithm can aggressively exploit redundancy at any scale to shrink text more efficiently. I applied this measurement to 15,000 songs that charted on the Billboard Hot 100, and this was the distribution of compression rates. In general, pop lyrics compress very well. A typical piece of prose, such as an essay, only gets reduced in size by about 10% by the compression algorithm, but an average song gets cut in half. Also, the most repetitive songs are really repetitive. <laughs> uh, when I made this chart, I left out the 20 most repetitive songs in the data set, but here's what it looks like with them added back in. And what is the most repetitive song in the history of the Billboard Hot 100, according to our metric? It turns out to be Around the World by Daft Punk, <laughs> which gets reduced in size by an astonishing 98% by the compression <laughs> algorithm. If you're not familiar with the song, here are the lyrics. And this is heartening to see, because it agrees with our intuition about what a repetitive song looks like. <laughs> so, now that we have a metric we're confident in, let's get back to that question. Are pop lyrics getting more repetitive over time? It turns out that, yes, they are. The average repetitiveness of the charts has gone up over time, much in the way the stock market has gone up over time. Some years it goes up and some years it goes down, but if you look over any 10-year period, it's always increased. In addition to measuring the aggregate trend, I wanted to look at individual songs and see where and how the repetitiveness manifested. I wanted the visual language of the structure of songs. And for this, I borrowed from another unlikely field, bioinformatics. This is what's called a self-similarity matrix, or a dot plot. Biologists use them to visualize DNA sequences. And DNA is a bit like a pop song. It repeats itself in interesting ways and on different scales. So here on the left, we have a visualization of some DNA, and on the right is Lady Gaga's Bad Romance. <laughs> Lady Gaga has been accused of copying Madonna, but until now, has anyone considered whether she's plagiarizing the human genome? <laughs> the matrix on the right was constructed using the same method as the one on the left. The only difference is that rather than considering a sequence of bases in DNA, now we're considering a sequence of words in a song. Here's a small example of how this works. We can imagine the words of the song arranged along the rows and the columns of the matrix. Time passes from top to bottom and left to right. When a row and column have the same word, the corresponding cell gets filled in. The main diagonal running from top left to bottom right is always filled in because the first word always matches the first word and so on. The interesting stuff is what's happening away from that main diagonal. Patterns off the main diagonal represent two different points in time that have the same text. In this case, the phrase A bar B. Generally, the more of these patterns we see, the more repetitive the song is. Now, let's return to a full pop song. This is Tick Tock by Kesha. Structurally, it's about as conventional as it gets. Let's break down what's going on. The song starts with a verse. Verses are, by definition, not repeated, so we can visually recognize them by the gutters that they form in the corresponding rows and columns. That is to say, they don't look very much like any other part of the song. And we have another verse about halfway through, and then there are these repeated green diagonals. Anytime we see a big chunk of song that's exactly repeated a few times, it's probably a chorus. And that's what these green blocks are that make up most of the rest of the song. Finally, we have a bridge about three quarters of the way through. The bridge isn't repeated elsewhere, but 
In this case, unlike the verses, it's internally repetitive. It has a unique structure that distinguishes it from the verses and from the chorus. Putting it all together, we get the recipe for a vanilla pop song. First chorus, first chorus, bridge chorus. Browse through some recent hits, and you'll see plenty that follow roughly this pattern. Though each brings its own flavor, sometimes the chorus is just a straight line of repeated words, sometimes the chorus has a rich internal structure of its own, repetition within repetition. Some songs lead with the chorus, and some make us wait a long time for it. And some dispense with the concepts of verse and chorus entirely and just do their own thing. And this is particularly true when we look at some of the most repetitive examples in the data set, that is, the most compressible songs. So the evidence is right in front of our eyes. Pop music is really repetitive, and it's getting more and more repetitive year by year. Does this sound like bad news? Well, now I want to try to convince you otherwise. Let's return to that meme I showed at the beginning. What's the joke here? At the very least, there's an implication that the song on the left should be easier to write than the song on the right, because it's repetitive. And so it's funny that the simple song has so many writers and producers, whereas the non-repetitive one has only one. But it's likely that anyone sharing this on Facebook would also agree with the following statements, that the song on the left is worse than the song on the right, that music as a whole is getting worse because it's getting more repetitive, that repetitive songs, like the one on the left, are droning, unimaginative, recycled, lazy. When I originally published my research on this topic, I was aghast to see that some readers thought that I was one of those people, that I was making a point about the decline of music. But that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, I love repetitive music. And whether they want to admit it or not, everyone loves repetitive music. Psychologists have shown this experimentally. One study found that artificially inserting repetitiveness into classical compositions caused listeners to rate them as not just catchier, but as being of higher quality. And the charts reflect this. Let's go back to that trend in repetitiveness in the charts over time. The blue line is averaged over all songs that reach the top 100 in each year. But this orange line is only songs that reach the top 10. The top 10 are more repetitive than the rest of the charts in every single year from 1960 to present and the gap seems to be widening. I was astonished by the consistency of this trend. So, arguably, songwriters are just giving us what we want. Listeners respond positively to repetitiveness. What about those words that our hypothetical Facebook friend uses to describe repetitive pop songs? Mindless, lazy, unimaginative. I want to argue against those, too, because repetitive songs can be repetitive in an endless variety of ways. Remember those matrices? Structurally, pop songs are snowflakes. And paradoxically, the most repetitive songs are also some of the most diverse looking. This is Can't Get You Out of My Head by Kylie Minogue. It's highly compressible, insanely catchy, and structurally fascinating. The first thing we notice is these big black blocks. What are those? They represent ultra-dense regions of internal repetition, parts of the song where everything looks like everything else. These black holes of repetition arise when a single word is chanted in succession. In this case, that word is just la. One of the song's main hooks, which it jumps into right at the start, just goes la, 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 la. <laughs> in fact, the lyrics of this song are about 47% la by volume. <laughs> After introducing that la hook, we get the song's other main hook, which has a few more words, but is still short and sweet. It mostly consists of repetitions of the title phrase, which is colored pink here, I just can't get you out of my head. Virtually the entire song is built out of these two short, simple hooks. Here's another strange one by the singer Lord. In a sense, this song is also highly repetitive. Again, we're at a loss to find anything that we could call a verse. There's no part of the song that isn't repeated at some other point. But whereas the previous song was built out of just two short hypnotic hooks, this one has a lot of distinct repeating parts, and none of them is repeated very many times. And the fact that these patterns all occur close to the main diagonal tells us that when parts are repeated, the repeated instances are close in time to one another. There's no chorus, no global hook that runs throughout the song. As a whole, this creates a very different effect than the use of repetition in the previous song. Can't Get You Out of My Head is, on the surface, a song about obsessive love, but it's also a song about being an earworm. The relentless repetition of short hypnotic hooks worked because it was a case of form matching content. 
It employs artful repetition to put a virus in the listener's mind that they can't get out of their head. <laughs> Whereas this song is telling a story with a beginning, middle, and end. She meets a boy, they fall in love, it falls apart, she wants it back. The repetitions are about reinforcing or reiterating an earlier piece of the narrative, contrasting the latest development with what came before. Both the previous songs were highly repetitive, but they were repetitive in ways that were very different from each other and from any other song on the radio. It would be hard to defend labeling them as unoriginal or boring. Also, repetitiveness may be on the rise lately, but it's always been an essential ingredient of music and verse. Poets often repeat the same phrase at the beginning of several lines. The technical term for this is anaphora. But when Lady Gaga does it, we're more likely to use the term lazy. When a top 40 song repeats the same short melody on a loop without variation, we might dismiss it as monotonous. But once again, when a respectable artist does it, we have a respectable sounding Greek word for it. We call it an ostinato. <laughs> and the parallels to poetry are more than superficial. Pop music is just poetry with a beat. Songwriters use repetitive patterns of syllabic stress just like poets do. You might remember from high school English, Shakespeare's plays were mostly an iambic pentameter, meaning built out of pairs of unstressed syllables followed by stressed. Ba-da, 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 ba-da. It turns out that the Britney Spears classic Baby One More Time is also mostly iambic. Did Britney or Max Martin, the song's writer, sit down and think to themselves, I'd like this chorus to be an iambic tetrameter? <laughs> no, but at least subconsciously, they knew what Shakespeare and every other poet knows, which is that regular patterns of alternating stress just sound nice. The alternation of stressed and unstressed syllables in song is as natural as the alternation of the kick drum and the snare. Also, notice that in the first line, Spears sings loneliness, rather than the normal stress we would use in conversation, loneliness. So we know the song isn't iambic purely by coincidence. She's fighting to adhere to that meter. Shakespeare didn't hew strictly to iambic pentameter. Sometimes, often for deliberate effect, he would replace an iamb, bada, with a troche, the opposite of that, bada, like gentle. Sometimes he would break the flow even more strongly by making an entire line trochaic, bada, 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 bada. Does that rhythm sound familiar? Well, Brittany does something similar. The penultimate line of the chorus introduces a variation with one troche and one iamb, and the final line flips the script by being entirely trochaic. It's clever in a few ways. First, the inversion mirrors a shift in the story. Brittany goes from plaintively describing her emotional state to making a demand. And you simply can't start a sentence with hit me and not put emphasis on the hit. It's also commercially shrewd. The punchy contrasting rhythm of that final line makes it memorable. And that final line also happens to be the title of the song. So repetition in music is nothing new. It can be employed with endless variation, and it's inherently enjoyable. And yet, there seems to be a default assumption that pop music is noxious because anything so addictive must be bad for you, and anything with such wide appeal must be dumbed down or without artistic merit. But I want to question those assumptions. Bubblegum pop earworms shouldn't be a guilty pleasure. They're just a pleasure whether on the surface level as something to sing along to in the car or as an object of deeper investigation. I'm glad that songwriters are honing their techniques to create increasingly catchy and repetitive earworms. So, yeah, music just ain't what it used to be, but maybe it's better. Thanks. Thanks.